guys, Olive here, here today to tell you about what I read in May of 2019. Per usual, I'll start off by talking about all those books that I have not previously discussed in any other video. The first of those was my pick off of my five-star nonfiction predictions list for May. That was Buzz, The Nature and Necessity of Bees by Thor Hansen. This is a compact natural history of bees that looks at their evolution, anatomy, and behavior, and also gives a clear picture of just how important bees are in our lives, the invisible role that they play and getting food on our tables. In true Thor Hansen fashion, he shows this by going to his local McDonald's and ordering a Big Mac. But the catch is that he will only allow himself to eat the parts of the burger that bees didn't play a role in producing. Suffice it to say, he leaves the restaurant less than satisfied. But that's just the genius of Thor Hansen's writing. All of his books are incredibly informative. He talks to a lot of experts where he doesn't have that expertise himself, but he is also incredibly enthusiastic, so it makes all of his books incredibly engaging. But then he also finds these ways to bring the science directly to your doorstep, which makes it fun and extremely relatable. He also doesn't lean into the impulse to romanticize his subjects. People tend to get really lovey-dovey on bumblebees, exhibit A, my shirt right now, because they have a teddy bear quality to them. They're really cute. And then there's the symbiotic relationship between bees and flowers. The efficiency of that relationship is often showcased as the beauty of nature working in perfect harmony. You can almost hear the harps in the background. But it's really not like that. As he says in the book, bees see flowers as a resource and flowers see bees as a tool. There's no sentimentality to it. They're both a couple of users. But just because nature always shows itself to be red in tooth and claw does not mean that this relationship between bees and flowers is any less amazing. It's a really interesting book done extremely well. This is why he's one of my favorite nonfiction authors. The next book that I picked up in May is another science book that I picked up rather spontaneously. That is An Elegant Defense by Matt Richtel. This book is all about the immune system, but the way that it's told attempts to make it more human in its approach. He explains the science through the stories of four different people who are each battling illnesses that push the immune system to the edge. Cancer, HIV, and then two different autoimmune diseases. I liked this concept quite a lot. I think stories within nonfiction can make us feel a whole lot closer to the subject matter at hand. But in the case of this book, the execution was scattered and uneven. He begins most chapters with the story of a person. Sometimes it's one of the four sick people that he's talking about. Sometimes it's other people. But what he does is dive into the science and completely forget to check back in with that story of the person. So by the time we loop back around to the person in question, we've more or less forgotten who he's talking about. I did really enjoy some of the metaphors he would use to describe elements of our immune system. For example, he compared autoimmunity to a police state, and then he personified wound healing as a SWAT team coming in and then being followed up by construction workers. I'm sure seasoned scientists would roll their eyes at this, but I really liked it. And speaking of highly educated scientists, I have seen some criticism of this book on Goodreads, saying that the science in this book is a little iffy, that it's not entirely reliable. I am not super educated in science. I do not have a science degree, a medical degree, anything in between. And so I'll have to trust their judgment and remain skeptical. I will certainly want to read some more books before I take anything I read in this book too seriously, especially because it was clear by the way this book was written that he was more invested in the personal element. That's because one of the four sick people he chooses to focus on in this book is a personal friend of his. He makes no secret of that fact. He grew up with this guy and big portions of this book are straight up about his personal relationship with him. It was touching at parts, but none of the other people in this book got that kind of focused attention. You could feel the scales leaning. It was a decent read, but it's not going to get that hearty of a recommendation from me. And then I finally read Atonement by Ian McEwen. This was the penultimate book that I needed to read for my 10 most popular books on my TBR project that I've been working on for about a year now. I was dreading reading this book because I watched the movie when I was maybe 15 years old. I realized that sounds young. I was a very mature teenager, but I had never before experienced a harrowing tale like this. So it left capital W wounds on my psyche. But going through this book, finally, I realized that my tolerance is now a lot higher because I read a lot of dark things, but also I knew what was coming. So it really wasn't that bad. 
In fact, I quite enjoyed it. This book is about a 13-year-old aspiring storyteller named Bryony, who basically misunderstands a series of events because of her age. We're able to see how badly she's misconstruing things because we're getting multiple perspectives of different people involved in this story as it moves along. But there's a pivotal moment in this book where Bryony makes a very bold judgment call, thinking a little bit too much of her side of the situation, as 13-year-olds are wont to do. Only this specific act of hubris has long-reaching and devastating impacts on this entire cast of characters. We're able to see how hard-hitting this is because we fast forward from 1935 when this takes place into the 40s during World War II and then beyond, and we can see how everything in these characters' lives is different because of this one act of Bryony's. I was really impressed by this book. The writing is so elegant, and it manages to be compact yet also sprawling at the exact same time. Years pass and McEwen is somehow able to make that feel like not a big deal in the reading experience, but makes you feel the weight of those years through the storytelling. It's really remarkable. And then in May, I hosted my very first read along, which was of The Big Green Tent by Ludmila Ulitskaya. This is a huge historical novel all about a web of dissident characters in the post-Stalin Soviet Union. At the heart of this story are three young boys who we quickly see grow into men, Ilya, Sanya, and Miha. Soon after we meet them, we become introduced to the other characters that people their lives, often to the point of overshadowing the central trio. I wouldn't even say this story has a central plot. It's more about these people and the ways in which they're navigating the Soviet system, and that sometimes means escaping it. I loved some of the sections in here about what literature can mean in one's life how music can move you, and how friendship evolves over time. I also thought it was so interesting to see some historical and social elements of Soviet life come through on the page. I know these things really well from history books, but I've never seen them come to life in a novel, so that was really cool for me. I'm really glad I hosted a read-along for this one because I gained so much insight from the other people who were reading this book with me. It was just about every other chapter where I wasn't sure how I was feeling about this book. I would read a chapter that I loved and be totally engrossed, and then I would read one where I didn't really see the point of having all these side characters if they were distracting from the central three. Some people in the Goodreads group did have a similar reaction, so there was a camaraderie factor actor. But they also pointed out things that I would have never really noticed. I went into this book for entirely different reasons. I'm an entirely different type of reader. So it's nice to hear what other people get out of a book at the same time that you're reading it. It's one of the reasons why I love buddy reads. And obviously the more people that are involved, the more perspective you can gain. If you would like to read any of those thoughts that any of us had as we were going through this book, I will link the Goodreads page down below for you to go and peruse at your leisure. And the last book I'll discuss at length in this wrap up video is the random book off of my TBR for the month that my patrons chose for me. That was Dressed Up for a Riot, Misadventures in Putin's Moscow by Michael Idov. This is, as you can see, another book on Russia, albeit a much more modern one. It is Idov's memoir of a very specific time in his life where he was living and working in Moscow during a very tumultuous period of modern Russian history. Idov was born in Latvia when it was a part of the USSR, but moved to the United States during his formative years and grew up here. And then in 2009, he published a novel which was deemed very average by American audiences, but really struck a nerve in Russia, not just because of his Soviet background, but also because it showed this New York lifestyle, which Russians found very aspirational, apparently. After winning a Russian award for the novel at an elaborate party during which a prominent Russian socialite kisses him on the mouth for the sake of spectacle, he unwittingly becomes a B-list Russian celebrity and is offered the job of editor of Russian GQ. He takes the job, but very quickly learns that this is going to be a very different type of working environment. But at the time he accepted this job, Russia was standing at the precipice of a really important point in their history. Putin had his eyes set on a comeback, and the population had some mixed feelings about this. Idov saw and was involved in a lot of the protest activity that was happening at this time, and so he can give a lot of first-hand accounts of what it was like. So this book is kind of two-pronged. On one side of things, we see the churning of dissent before, during, and after Putin's reclamation of the throne in 2012. But on the other side of things, it's a portrait of modern society in Moscow and all the absurdities that make up that weird but wonderful place. I think Michael Idov's positioning 
makes him such an interesting person to tell this story. And not just the fact that he was living and working in Moscow at the time and attending some of these protests, although that certainly helps things, but he is enough of an insider to understand what's going on and enough of an outsider to give us an outside perspective. Just because of who he is, he's able to give a really unique but also necessary take on what was going on inside Russia at that time. He knows enough to give details and to be able to explain things to us, but he can also empathize with our outsider, what the hell is going on over there type of attitude. But I will say, I don't know if Michael Idov considers himself an American or not, but the tone of this book is so incredibly Russian. It is downright acerbic and I loved it. I highly recommend this book if you are interested in that pussy riot, Russia without Putin period. And then to round out this wrap up, I will talk about the three books that I have discussed in other videos. I've done a ton of book reviewing on this channel this month, which I am really proud of. Before I was endeavoring to make reviewing more of a priority on my channel, and now I'm at the point where I have to talk myself out of doing a full length book review for every single book I read. First, I did a review of what would become my favorite book of the month. That was Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, A Therapist, Her Therapist, and Our Lives Revealed by Lori Gottlieb. This is a memoir of a therapist, Lori Gottlieb, who goes to see her own therapist when she's going through a particularly challenging period in her life. We see her go through this process of healing and also of developing a whole new level of self-awareness. And along the way, we meet some of her own patients who we grow very close to. It's a really thoughtful and emotional memoir that mimics the therapy experience as it moves along. I thought it was wonderful. Please feel free to check out my full review of it. If you'd like to hear more of my thoughts, I loved it. And then I did a mixed media review of not just Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup by John Carreyrou, but also of a podcast and documentary that also covered the Theranos scandal. This book is very hyped and I did enjoy it. But I don't think people are considering John Kerry Rue's role in the story seriously enough because it really does call into question his ability to be impartial. He is the journalist who exposed this fraud with his story, in case you didn't know. I also think that the hype is rather overblown for this book, and I will tell you why. I think sometimes non-regular nonfiction readers will dip into a very popular nonfiction work like this and see how engaging and immersive nonfiction can be. But then they'll forget that enjoyment of a book and quality are not necessarily the same thing. Most of the time when I've heard people review this book, I've heard things along the lines of, oh my God, this story is so crazy. I couldn't believe that any of this actually happened. The truth really is stranger than fiction. Yes, that's true. This story is explosive and super interesting. But John Carreyrou didn't invent this story. He's simply recounting it. So to judge this book's quality, we have to look at how he goes about doing that. And we can see whether or not it's effective. And I don't think the way John Carreyrou chose to tell this story was very effective. The whole Theranos thing was a circus. And it really could have used a ringmaster to direct the reader's eye. He just kind of bread and butter slaps it onto the page and it still works because the story is unbelievable. But we shouldn't be lauding his skill because the story is so interesting. If you want to hear any more of my thoughts on this or you want to hear me compare this book to its podcast and documentary counterparts, I will link that video down below for you. And lastly, continuing in my efforts to read all of the nonfiction that everyone has been discussing over the past few months, I also finally read The Library Book by Susan Orlean. This book tells the story of the devastating 1986 Los Angeles Public Library fire that the media didn't talk a whole lot about because it was overshadowed at the exact same time by the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The author does look at the story of the man who was accused of setting the fire. And so this book has been characterized as kind of a bookish true crime story, but I think it is grossly miscast in that role. This is actually a mixed bag of a nonfiction book that recounts the fire, certainly, but also talks about so many different things that are even tangentially related to the fire, such as arson and firefighting, the history of the city of Los Angeles, how books are salvaged best from water damage because they were damaged with the hoses used to put out the fire, and ultimately what the purposes of libraries are. It goes into all of these things just deeply enough to satisfy, but keeps it casual enough to make the whole reading experience feel really snug and cozy. I did a tipsy review of this one in which I drink some fireball whiskey while reviewing the book. 
ill-advised, but I will link that down below in case you missed it. So those are all the books that I finished during the month of May. I'd love to hear from you if you've read any of these books, if you've heard of them, or if you'd now like to read them after hearing me talk about them. You can let me know that or any other general comments or questions you may have in the comment section below. But you can also find me on a variety of different places on social media. The links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye!